This is episode 68 with Doctor of Physical Therapy, Strength and Conditioning Coach, and Physiotherapist, Ryan Smith. Hey all, welcome back to the Strength Running Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Fitzgerald, and it seems like I have been away for a while. I've actually been on a a quick vacation uh, at the very end of August, so I'm excited to be back. I went to visit some family and friends on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Now, I'm not sure when you bring three children across two time zones if that counts as a vacation. But I'm going to say yes. It was <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, I didn't get a lot of sleep, but nevertheless, I uh, got in some good runs and was staying with a friend of mine who's uh, a much more competitive runner than I ever was. And it was great to train with him a little bit like we used to do back in the good old days. But now I am excited to be back. I did film some great beach running shots, and I'll be putting together a, a Q&A on beach running really soon, and so you can look for that on Strength Running's YouTube channel, and uh, you can go ahead and subscribe if you want to know exactly when it is first published. All right, um, before we move on to our discussion today, a big thanks to Steady MD for sponsoring today's episode. Steady MD pairs you with a primary care doctor online a doctor who really gets to know you, listens to you, and actually has the time for you. And it's not really any doctor. It's a doctor who is a fellow runner and who really understands everything from marathon training, proper running form, common running injuries, nutrition, and a lot more. So they're available to you uh, over the phone, text, video chat, really any time. And if you go to steadymd.com slash strengthrunning, you can learn more and reserve your spot. There are a limited number of spots available, so I wouldn't wait too long just to see what they're all about. You can go to steadymd.com slash strengthrunning for more. All right, today on the program is Ryan Smith. He's a physiotherapist with a doctor of physical therapy, CrossFit coach, and a lead instructor for the Institute of Clinical Excellence in the Fitness Athlete Division. He specializes in treating individuals who participate in CrossFit, Olympic lifting, powerlifting, and other sports like running. He's a former soccer player and a wrestler, and he believes strongly in strength training throughout your lifetime and is also an avid supporter of the Senior Rehab Project. And in this conversation, we're going to focus on movement knowledge, pain, common physical problems he sees among runners, and a lot more. I should note that this interview is just an excerpt of our full conversation, which was made available earlier to Team Strength Running members. This is Strength Running's popular group coaching program, and if you'd like to learn more, you can go ahead and sign up at strengthrunning.com slash TSR. Without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Ryan Smith. Hey, Ryan, thank you for speaking with me today. Hey, Jason, thanks for having me on. So... I'm looking forward to this. I think this is going to be interesting uh, because you are a physiotherapist and we're going to talk all kinds of uh, all kinds of issues about uh, injuries and staying healthy and pain and all kinds of great stuff. But I want to start with uh, the difference between a physical therapist and a physiotherapist. Is there a difference? Because I've seen both terms out there. And at this point, I'm almost embarrassed to ask. (laughs) I don't even know. (laughs) No, uh, no, it's a common question. Physiotherapist is generally used in the rest of the world. It's only in the U.S. that we use physical therapists. So in the same way, football around the world means soccer to us, and soccer is football, and here in America, it's very similar. But you, most people use physical therapists and physiotherapists um, interchangeably here in the States. Um, I'd say traditionally most of the public knows physical therapist better than a physiotherapist. Wow, I learned something today. <laughs> and I feel like we are like behind the rest of the world, like with the metric system, we should probably just all get on board with physiotherapist. Oh, I know. And physio, it just sounds so much better. It's got a ring to it. It just, it rolls off the tongue better. I, I Hopefully agree. at some point we all switch over. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's a better term. I think it, it yes. lends more, I, I think it's more of a professional term for your, for your profession. hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you see a lot of dysfunctional athletes, and we're talking to a group of runners today. So um, let's talk about that group. I mean, these are folks with injuries, imbalances, uh, different types of weaknesses. Uh, so I'd, I'm curious, Ryan, what are some of the, the issues 
that you find are really common among runners that come in, no matter what you know specific injury they might have? What are some of the the limiting issues that are present? Yeah, um, and this might not even get uh, pathology specific for it, uh, but what I see the biggest issues being for most runners, whether it's it, it originates in the ankle, hip, knee, back, or where have you, it's it's a difficulty with the amount of load they're taking on or, or training load. And it's these acute spikes in load of running or a change in running load um, that they don't realize has happened. And all of a sudden, their body is affected and they become sensitized in whatever area it might be. Um, so f- for me, that's kind of the, the biggest issue I see. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a uh, body part specific. It's a acute change in training load or a difficulty pushing themselves at a certain load too much that manifests then in some sort of musculoskeletal injury. Uh, and that can be different across the board. I'd say if I were to go pathology specific for the question, I see a lot of lateral hip pain, um, and lateral knee pain to be the biggest ones that people kind of come in. Um, things being a little bit more angry or sensitized for those runners. Now, when you talk about load, can you uh, explain that to someone who's never been in to see a physiotherapist? What is what is load when it comes to runners? Yeah, so when it comes to runners, the easiest way to look at that is mileage, right? So the, the load is the amount of work or mileage you're taking on at a specific time. Um, usually in research, what we're looking at um, they look at the acute load, so what you've done in the last week, and they compare it to the chronic load or the last four weeks. So when I say people are having like an acute spike, it means their last week of training has exceeded the average of the previous four weeks. Um, and that's when I find people trying to get into more trouble, um, and they might not even realize it. So load can be boiled down to the mileage. Um, if we look at it from purely like a musculoskeletal or um, biomechanical way, the kicker is the load can be affected um, by how we think about it, by our nutrition, by our sleep, by our recovery, everything within there. But for runners, I think the easiest way to look at it is load is your mileage or additional training or cross training you do. I really like that you compare the last week of training to the previous four weeks of training because it kind of forces the athlete to look at their training from a more long-term perspective. So instead of focusing on, you know, how many miles did I run this week? Now they're starting to think, okay, well, you know, that's important, but maybe it's more important what I do on a monthly basis because then, you know, I'm not going to be increasing it too quickly or, uh, you know, too haphazardly and that's going to lead to injuries. You know, I'm always telling runners, um, Let's try to think of mileage in terms of monthly totals, because every runner wants to talk about how many miles they're running a week. Um, But when you can think a little bit more long term and bigger chunks of time, I think that kind of a mindset really lends itself well to keeping runners healthier for longer periods of of time, because they're not going to be jacking up their mileage uh, too quickly from month to month. It's it's more of a uh, it's a more difficult thing to do when you're talking about those, you know, longer timescales. And so I think that's a uh, a really helpful thing that you're helping runners to see by talking about, you know, the juxtaposition of their previous week of training and then what they were doing for the month beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on all all fronts there. And the the funny thing is for how in tune so many runners are with their weekly mileage, they, they don't really look at that total monthly or even like half year mileage or what they were doing a year ago, um, which I think is a shame. It can lead to a lot of solutions and kind of aha moments for them in terms of if they are coming with an injury um because from a, from a psychological perspective it's all of a sudden like oh okay it isn't that this part of my knee is wrong or there's something wrong with my hip or my back it's wow i had a huge increase in training load or mileage that my body just wasn't quite ready for let me bring that back a little bit and build up slower and maybe it'll adapt a little bit more positively going forward and that's really uh, i think movement optimistic message i'd want to get out to a lot of runners looking at it that way Right, right. And, uh, you know, the other thing that I want to emphasize here is that, you know, you mentioned a lot of runners, they'll come in and, you know, they'll talk about their knee problem or their hip problem. And it's not really like there's an issue with the, the knee itself, or there's a problem with how the knee operates or moves. It's a training issue. And I think, you know, as a running coach, I'm the one responsible for that training. And, you know, I, I always tell runners, 
you know, strength training is probably one of the most valuable things you can do from an injury prevention perspective, but no amount of strength training is going to make up for really poor training habits. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about right now is poor training habits, jacking your mileage up too quickly and, you know, increasing that load so that your body's just hasn't adapted quickly enough and can't handle it. And so I think it's, it's, important for runners to recognize that the training is the most important injury prevention tactic that they have in their toolbox. It's proper progression of mileage, proper progression of pace and intensity, and, you know, not biting off more than you can, you can chew. I think my, uh, my college cross country coach always told us to avoid the three twos too much mileage, too soon before you're ready for it at too fast a pace. And if you can internalize mm. that, I just love that, that three twos framework. Yeah, no, that I'm probably going to steal that from you at some point. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> that yours. sounds fantastic. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. It, it, I think it takes a lot of humility to recognize those three twos as well. And for some people to be like, you know, I'm not quite ready for that. And that's a lot of conversations I'll have too of what do you need to be ready for and what does that time frame look like? And for a lot of us, it's very humbling, especially for me who is slowly getting into more running of like, you know, I'm not quite ready for that exact race yet or this or that. Let me build it up because there's no reason for me to go into it as hard as I need to that quickly or too much or too fast or before I'm too ready. Yeah, patience, I think, is, is such an undervalued trait among distance runners and that if you can simply be a more patient, more cautious runner, then I think you're going to be uh, a healthier runner in the long term. Now, Ryan, I want to ask you really quickly about, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about load. And I think, you know, when I learned more about exercise science and, you know, we talk about this issue as running coaches, we, we also use the term workload. And workload really refers to the total amount of work that you do in a given week. And I think mileage is the first thing that runners think about when they think about, okay, how much work did I do last week uh, or last month for that matter? But, you know, the other kind of flip side to this coin is the intensity side of things. It's not just the volume. It's, you know, how, how fast you're doing it, what kind of paces you're using. How do you talk to runners about uh, their pace, how fast they're running, how that can contribute to injuries from this perspective of, you know, load and not increasing that too quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that workload, I'd also look at, you, you can have a quantity definition of just the pure mileage you've done. You can also have the quality of that, both in, you know, how efficient is your technique, but also at what speeds um, and what cadence and stuff are you going at. And that can change a lot of how the load goes to the body. Um, so looking at it from a quality perspective of, for me, the, the one thing that I can almost tell most runners from an injury prevention or at least a reduction in risk of injury is that, an increased cadence for most people by somewhere between 5 to 10% is probably a good thing unless you're already at an extremely high cadence. So for especially for a lot of my novice runners that come in, I, I look at that first because um, the research amongst everything they've tried to look at for running mileage, they've shown that a slight increase in cadence generally disperses a lot more of that force going through the body and generally we see a decrease in risk of uh, reduction of injury. Um, so that's from that standpoint, that's why I look at the quality. In addition, and the more I've learned from the running world is that uh, I feel like a lot of coaches have taught me, go fast in your fast days and slow on your slow days. And really, I think a lot of coaches, runners are starting to show their history of running uh, and their workload and showing I have been going really slow and staying true to that on the days I need to go slow. And that's the majority of their mileage. Um, I think the, my favorite part is that when, as I start to get more into it, I realize as a novice runner, it's very, very difficult to separate the slow days from the fast days without realizing it. I think that's made me a little more empathetic to the conversation I have with runners coming in of, you know, what do your fast days look like and what is that load like on your body? And what do your slow days look like and how do you feel after those? So those three things of looking at a cadence, looking at how fast are your fast days and how slow are your slow days uh, are all how I'd look at the quality of load for a runner in that perspective. I love it. Yeah, those are all such terrific uh, both indicators of potential injury and also uh, specific things that you can modify in your training to reduce your injury risk. Um, you know, cadence is something that, you know, I think a lot of runners have heard, you know, let's try to get 180 steps a minute. 
Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I've stepped back from that a little bit just because I know that, look, if you're running a 10 minute mile, you're probably not going to have a cadence of, of 180 steps a minute. But (laughs) you know, if you're, um, you know, my litmus test is if you're at 170 or more steps a minute, then you're probably fine. Um, so just to give runners some, some numbers behind that, that cadence idea, um, the other thing that you said that I want to talk a little bit about is is just the the easy days easy hard days hard. Um, you know that is something that's kind of been around in running lore for you know hundred <laughs> years. But you're right; it is so hard to actually execute on on a day to day basis, especially you know when so many runners are these Type A athletes who who think you know the harder I go, the better I'm going to get. And of course, there's a shred of truth to that. You just have to be strategic with it. Um, and I, and I think if runners can simply go slower on their easy days and really make sure that the overall effort is, is just super easy. Like if they finish that run and go, man, that was easy, then you're doing the right thing. That was perfect. That was, that's the effort that you're looking for. Um, now what, what I liked about your answer is that you actually talked about some solutions. You talked about improving your cadence. You talked about going easy on your easy days. Uh, you talked about focusing your effort on those hard days. Um, you know, we talked some about, you know, some of the big common dysfunctions that runners tend to have. Um, and, and a lot of that is training related besides some of the suggestions you had, you know, how can runners go about resolving some of those issues so that they can reduce their overall injury risk? Yeah, absolutely. And it might be obvious cause we're on a strength running um, talk right now, but strength training is hands down, probably one of the best ways they can do that in the sense of uh, a good foundational strength training um, can give your body more capacity to allow you to train at the level you want to or train more. And I like to make that distinction for runners because I always want to say, you know, the strength training won't necessarily make you a better runner, but it will give your body the resiliency and capacity to allow you to run more. And ultimately, the more you run, in general, the better runner you become. And I think that's that's what strength training is going for. Um, so regardless of the pathology of where it's at in the body, looking at this from can you move relatively well with body weight? Can you do, I was my favorite one for runners, can you do 20 single leg calf raises and not burn out and get full range of motion? Can you do um, a, a, a single leg squat with some sort of capacity to find balance and maintain quality positions? Can you master those first? And if you can, perfect. Well, now we know that running demands more in the body of at least one to one and a half times the body weight for each step. So can you single leg squats or lunge with some amount of weight? doesn't need to be a ton, but dumbbells, kettlebells, um, can you hold on to that and help and can your body sustain that? Um, so I think doing those things will help with a lot of the nagging aches and pains that most runners have because very rarely is it an acute injury. It's a chronic long-term kind of comes back and flares up here and there. And that's just the body kind of going through of, I don't know if I have the capacity right now to maintain this amount of load. Um, what are we going to do to change that? And building that capacity up and that resiliency up in the tissues and the body can start with strength training and moving a little bit better to feel a little bit better. There's a strength and conditioning coach up here in Boulder, Colorado that, uh, you know, he had a line that I don't think I'm ever going to forget. He said, there are no weak, fast runners. And I think that's <laughs> such a great way of of talking about the fact that runners have to be strong to be good. And so if you are good, if you are fast, if you post competitive times, then you do have a, a high level of strength. And so uh, I think if, if you get into the weight room and you can't do some of those things that you mentioned, Ryan, like calf raises and, and pistol squats, then you know, you're not a, you're not going to be able to perform as well as you probably could if you were stronger. But, you know, it also means that you're going to have a higher injury risk. I think it's interesting that running is often considered kind of an easy sport, uh, but it's an impact sport. It absolutely is an impact sport. It's you versus the ground. And those impact forces can be, uh, you know, many multiples of your body weight, like you mentioned. And, you know, I think it's crazy when, you know, runners can barely do some very simple body weight exercises, but then they expect to be able to run 40 miles in a week without injury. <laughs> and, you know, you're just kind of blown away by, by the, the audacity of the thinking. I'm really interested in the topic of pain science. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. not too familiar with it, but maybe you can give us a bird's eye view of, you know, what this particular subject is really about and, and how runners might benefit from knowing more about it. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, pain is really a hot topic in physiotherapy right now. Um, and do so, and it's changing a lot of the mindset we know and the research we've seen. So I think the big points I'd love for runners to know is that pain does not equal damage and damage does not equal pain, right? So if you do have knee or hip or ankle or back pain, that does not mean that you're having damage in that tissue specifically. Um, and we know that pretty unequivocally now based on a whole bunch of different studies ranging from years and years of data, which is really, really cool. Now, actually understanding that and taking that to consideration is really, really hard. Because when you have pain, most of us think of the worst of like, oh, what's going wrong with my knee? What's going wrong with the hip? Um, when in reality, it's, it's more about sensitivity um, to the specific muscle loading and to the tissue capacity of what's going on. So want to make sure that that point is, is really clear to runners that pain does not equal damage and damage does not equal pain, um, getting that across. Generally, what we're finding is that pain is an experience and it's, it's very significant to a lot of people um, because it, it takes in our emotional aspects and takes into our, our history of injury, what our beliefs are about pain. Um, and, and we really need to consider the person as a whole when talking about those types of things um, because we can't just say, you have knee pain, this is what's going on with the knee. Once we fix that part in the knee, you're going to feel better. We know that it's complicated. We know that there has to do with sleep and recovery, nutrition, all these aspects play a role. And if you have ongoing pain that's been lasting for a while, we know that, that the same way we talked about those neuron um, or, or firing patterns, right? Pain can latch on to certain movements and can become uh, more like a fire wet, fired together, wired together type of mantra more effectively. And that's not necessarily a good thing because pain can cause us either to adapt in a good way or in a bad way. And maybe the easiest way to understand that for runners is the ankle sprain analogy, right? We have an ankle sprain that's acute injury. There's a clear mechanism of injury that causes some sort of damage to that tissues. So we'd expect to have some pain. But for some people, that pain can be really, really high or really, really low based on their previous experience. Now, regardless of their experience, the body's going to want to take some time. It may limp a little bit and have some swelling. But after time, as things begin to heal, especially for ligaments, we know that's you know, four to eight weeks on average, we can generalize, that the body stops limping a little bit and starts testing those ranges of motion. And slowly over time, it starts getting that back. We start testing it out more and it improves. Now, sometimes people get that limp right? If it lasts for a long period of time, is actually a poor adaptation to the pain instead of a good one. Eventually, everything will heal. We should get better and we should stop limping and start getting back to activity. We know for a large or for a certain percentage of people that that's not the case all the time. And that limp can sometimes hang around regardless of the healing rate of what's going on. So I like to say to people, okay, in short term, the limping and the pain is a really, really good thing because it protects the stuff that's going on. But in the long term, a year later, I don't expect that to be happening. And for, I think, a lot of runners, they have that kind of cycle of pain coming back and forth, almost like they're chronically spraining their ankle all the time, even though they may not be any damage at all. Um, so that, that's one analogy I like to get across to runners a lot in that aspect of this is kind of what we're starting to see with pain. It's a very, very all-encompassing thing. It isn't one part of the tissue, and pain does not equal damage. Um, and I try to make that analogous as possible to their training and their life as possible. Uh, but it works out best when we take that within the context of your life and how pain affects you in certain ways. I like that you use that uh, ankle sprain analogy because I feel like that was just always present on our college teams because we did a lot of trail running. And it seemed like, you know, any given week, one of the one of our teammates would sprain his ankle or really just twist it, roll it when they're out there on the trails. And I do have a couple running friends that have rolled the same ankle so many times. And it's just, they'll tell you that after the first time, it was never the same. And this is super common among runners who have ankle issues, who, who tend to roll their ankles. And so I want to ask you specifically about that issue. What is going on with a runner who's turned their ankles a couple times, but it's three years later and their ankle either still hurts or just doesn't function the way that it's supposed to? Yeah. So, that, I mean, it could be a host of things. And I, I think one is that from an actual tissue perspective, in general, when we sprain our ligaments, they are, tend to be more lax. So you'll often see people who have a sprain on one ankle compared to the other. There's more laxity, which means that they have more range of motion to kind of stress those types of ligaments. So part of it is that is that their body has an easier time accessing those 
positions of sprained ankle or rolling their ankle spots. So that's one issue. The other issue is that once you have an injury, a true tissue injury, um, the body remembers really, really well. And a history of injury is our biggest predictor for a future injury. Across the board, we almost know that unequivocally. Um, so it might not always feel the same because they haven't worked it up or rehabbed it or tested it in a way that allows them to feel comfortable and confident with that, right? How many runners probably sprain their ankle and then just kind of walk it off a little bit, test it, and then just go back to running without ever thinking, okay, maybe I should test my single leg calf raise on this side, or maybe I should work on, you know, stressing those ligaments and those muscles and those bones in a different way to make sure that my ankle is adapting the way I want it to, to be strong again. Um, that might be moving more laterally. That might be, you know, lateral lunges or plyometrics or stuff, there's never really a gradual return to the activity they're doing. So oftentimes, the reason it never feels the same is because they've never given it the appropriate stress to allow it to adapt to be stronger. Um, and I, I'd say that's part of it. The other part of it is it never feels the same because, again, we we latch onto those histories of injury so that any time a future one happens, we're like, oh, yeah, that's my bad ankle. So now all of a sudden we give it a, a very personified position in our training life of that, that ankle is always going to be that bad one or always the one that doesn't feel right. Instead of really taking it um, head on and be like, okay, how can I make this feel better? What are the ways can I move differently to stress it appropriately? So I know I feel confident in it. Um, I'd say a whole host of those reasons are why it kind of feels slightly different. Yeah. Two of those are really interesting to me. I mean, first, you know, you said it's essentially part of it might just be in your head. You know, it's that, um, you know, remembering of the injury and you saying, oh, that's my bad ankle. It's not that you're just making it up, but there's this kind of association that you're playing in your brain. And, and I think that's that's just super interesting, you know, especially for runners who are dealing with any kind of a long term or chronic injury. Um, maybe this speaks to the importance of getting an injury treated and resolved as soon as possible so that you don't have this kind of long memory of, oh, yeah, that's my bad knee, my bad ankle. And, you, you know, <laughs> most of your joints are kind of like, oh, that's my <laughs> my bad joint. Um, now let me ask you about imbalances, uh, cause you've kind of mentioned, you know, we're talking about, you know, your bad ankle or, or something along those lines. Do you advise runners to exercise their weak or, you know, potentially the, the, the leg that fires less powerfully than the other? Do you suggest doing more exercises on that leg or is that just going to cause other problems too? I wouldn't say they need to do more on that specific side by any means. Uh, we do know when you work out one side of the body in general, there's some sort of neurological um, like sweeping over to the other side of the body. So you're getting some benefit both ways regardless. I would say that most runners just don't train enough unilaterally. And that by I mean, you know, single leg stances, split stances, even their upper body does not get trained unilaterally in a sporting demand, which is running, which demands unilateral movement. Um, so I wouldn't say they need to increase any more on one specific side. I would just say they need to do more training that is unilateral, that isn't running specific. Um, in terms of imbalances, unless it gets to a certain degree, we know that there's some sort of asymmetry and imbalance among most of us. Kind of like you mentioned the USA and a Bolt uh, example of how much time he spent on one um, leg versus the other. So I think that's ultimately going to be the case for everybody, some sort of asymmetry. But we usually don't see it significant until it's to a certain degree, and that's, that's variable. We know people coming back from ACL that uh, we like to measure the quad index, which is kind of a quad strength measurement of sorts, that those have to be somewhat similar before we feel like we have the best return to play criterion. I'd say anecdotally, if I see a major difference in someone's single leg calf raise right to left, I know there's probably going to be some biomechanical difference on their running ability in terms of where load's getting spread, and that one side might be taking on more than the other, um, and that could give me a clue of why certain things are taking on more um, than others, which could potentially have higher risk of injury um, for them if they're racking up enough mileage. So I would say don't chase the imbalances to look for perfection, but just train more unilaterally, and you'll probably address a lot of the issues that most people see with asymmetries and imbalances. Great. I love that advice. Um, now, in, in, in the interest of training unilaterally, um, what are some of your favorite single leg exercises for runners. Uh, now you did actually, um, mention some of your favorites for an article on the strength running blog. Uh, anyone listening it's is body weight, strength training, 
enough for runners. And, you know, you mentioned single leg deadlifts, single leg squats, um, lunges, and different plyometrics. Is there anything else you think that are uh, valuable exercises that every runner should be incorporating into their training? Those are the big ones, I think, bang for your buck. But I, I will say a, a lot of what I'd call almost like aesthetically pleasing dynamic running or dynamic drills of like we do a lot here for our CrossFit members who are getting into running of just walking on their tiptoes, um, both with knees straight and knees bent or doing little hops and pauses and holds in different positions along those lines. Um, I, I guess the simplest way for anybody listening to this to go look to experiment in those ways I know Chris Johnson, I believe is Zeren PT, Z-E-R-E-N-P-T, has an Instagram that does a ton of single leg work in terms of making things look good in a dynamic warm-up that stresses runners in a specific way. Um, so besides those strength training movements you mentioned that are in the article on the website, I think uh, his Instagram would be a really easy way to see a bunch of different really cool single leg stuff. Um, that can help you in terms of a dynamic warm up um, instead of me trying to list off a bunch of different things. But I'd say that would be the biggest ones that he likes to highlight are these lunge complexes and these squat complexes that get people onto their toes in different ways and that are walking in different ways and loading. Um, I think it's a really great resource that he offers um, from there in addition to the, the article that, you, that you've that you mentioned that you have at the website. Can you let me know that Instagram handle one more time? Yes, I believe it, it, it's Chris Johnson is his name, and it's Zeren PT, Z-E-R-E-N-P-T. Okay. Well, I will find him and link that up in the description here because I think that uh, that's really interesting. Uh, all right, Ryan, before we wrap up, I have a question from one of our community members, and it was actually echoed by a couple other folks, um, and it's about having a, a clicky hip or knee. Uh, I'm actually someone who, you know, I have a history of IT band syndrome in my left leg and my left leg constantly clicks right at the kind of IT band insertion at the knee. And so Jen submitted a question and for background, she said, I have a clicky right hip. There's no pain when it clicks, but it always makes this clicky sound during abduction. Not surprisingly, when I do wind up with pain or niggles, it's often in the area of my right hip. Uh, what stretches and strength training moves should I focus on to strengthen this area and prevent the click or at least prevent the inevitable injury that comes when I ramp up the miles? So that's that's her actual question. And I guess more broadly speaking, I'd love to know what is causing the clicks that so many runners have in various joints? And is it problematic? Should we be even focusing on this as something to fix? You know, what's going on in there? Great question. Um, I love that she refers to it as niggles because that's <laughs> one of my favorite words in terms of pain because it's not associated with anything uh, negative. Runners um, love that term. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Um, what I would say is, again, it, it depends on where it is exactly. I'd say the most um, common causes are usually some sort of inflammation of a tendon. Uh, we can definitely have some sort of uh, tendon that's inflamed and irritated kind of going over because usually those tendons are around bony prominences. So most people feel it on the lateral side of the hip or the outside of the lateral knee um, or kind of at the inside of the hip, all of which have bony areas that if something's kind of going across it, has the potential to have some sort of what I'd call a mechanical snapping um, type of sensation. What I do like that she mentions is she doesn't really have pain with, that, with those types of clicking, or, um, which I would reinforce. If there's no pain with it, um, just be okay with it, right? Most of us have some sort of clicking or cracking or snapping regardless of when we move, I like to tell my members that means that you're alive. Like it's a great thing. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I will say, if it is more hip generated, um, and sometimes even the knee, I would look at more of the cross training than trying to change anything running. And by cross training, I mean looking at if you have a snapping type of in, like hip that's internal or external, if you were to breathe and brace, like you kind of see weightlifters do, and then you do the same movement, does that improve the snapping? And if so, does it improve the snapping or clicking when you do like side planks or when you hold a, a front plank or something like that, um, which a lot of people probably term like core exercises. But to me, that's learning to create stability um, and controlling pressure in your abdomen that allows everything around your core, like all your extremities, to work in the way they need to 
So they're not tr trying to take on the, the stability for the rest of the core. So oftentimes when I see someone with kind of that snapping hip in the front, um, if we get them to do some weird things like dead bugs or play with their breath and breathing and bracing um, and really work through some deep diaphragmatic breaths and then do isometric holds like planks or side planks, sometimes that can really help out a lot uh, just for them getting to feel that their extremities can move appropriately and that their torso is doing what it's supposed to be doing and they've kind of trained that pattern over and over again. So I guess to summarize that, if there is clicking, snapping, or anything along those lines, it's not painful. Know that that happens for a lot of us, and it's a very normal part of being human. Um, but two, that look at kind of what you're doing from um, a breathing standpoint and a stability standpoint of your torso. And if some of those exercises improve the symptoms and the audible sound of the snapping or clicking, then you're probably on a good sign that um, it's more of that work that needs to be done in your cross training. And if that doesn't help and it's still clicking and it's painful, it could be a, a training load issue and that it's kind of just an irritated or sensitive tendon at that moment and there could be some inflammation and maybe that's just looking at your training load history um, and seeing that if I build up gradually does that help with the overall clicking and snapping type of um, sounds that you're hearing. You know, Ryan, one of the things I've learned from our conversation is that no matter what the issue, you know, it all kind of comes back down to let's make your training appropriate. You're not increasing your workload too quickly. And then on top of that, we are going to build in strength movements for strength and proper movement education, and then also drills and different varied exercises to really get through varied uh, ranges of motion and movement patterns. And all of that is going to make us a stronger, more athletic runner. And that's what helps prevent injuries. I think I just summarized our 45 <laughs> minute uh, conversation here. <laughs> A hundred percent agree. And I, I think the even underlying point of that is that if you, if you come to me and you're injured or in pain with running, my very last resort is to ever have you stop running. There's very few things you would ever tell me to be like, you need to stop. <laughs> you need to train differently and load yourself appropriately in weird ways sometimes. Um, and I think that's what runners get scared of if they go to a physiotherapist or any other healthcare professional is that they'll tell you to stop. And most of us that are starting to see the research and data and knowing how much running means to a lot of people is that we're going to try to keep you running as best we can. Um, it might be at a different level than you're used to. It might be slower or faster than you're used to, but we'll keep you doing what you love to do as much as we possibly can and knowing that that's the best way to actually get you better too. I love it. Guys, that is the kind of physiotherapist that you should be looking for, someone who's going to keep you out there on the road. Ryan, thanks so much for being here, taking the time. I appreciate your expertise and uh, all the different issues that we talked about today. I think this was super helpful. Thanks, Jason, for having me on. It was awesome. Great conversation. Hey, all. It's Jason. Thanks again for tuning into the show today. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ryan. We've been talking a lot about movement, fluency, athleticism, strength, and how we are not just runners. We are athletes that specialize in running. This is the year of strength on strength running, and I hope you'll go back and check out some of our earlier blog posts, videos, and podcast episodes that have to do with strength training and more broadly, the athleticism that's required to not only perform really well, but stay healthy. And if you'd like this full interview with Ryan and to learn more about team strength running, you can get on the priority list at strengthrunning.com slash TSR to be the first to know when we open and how you can become a member. Finally, a big shout out one more time to Steady MD. Strength Running is an official partner of Steady MD, which is led by sub three marathoner Dr. Josh Emder. The goal is to give you a personal doctor online that's just for runners to help you stay fit, healthy, injury free, and competitive. The best part there's no co pays, there's no waiting rooms or surprise bills. Instead, you'll get same day responses from a doctor who's actually there for you 24 7. And if you've ever seen a doctor or a physical therapist who has no experience with runners, then you know how valuable this is to hard-charging athletes. Having a doctor who gets you and your running goals is priceless. Go to SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning to see if there are spots left and how you can benefit from having a primary care physician who's also a runner. That's SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning. Thanks again, everyone. I appreciate you being here. Until next time.